Thank you to everyone for joining us. I'll go ahead and get started. I know people are still logging in, but uh, I think we've got a good number here to get started with. So good evening to everyone. My name is Esther Peters. I'm the Associate Director for the Center for East European and Russian Eurasian Studies at the University of Chicago. And I'm excited to welcome everyone to tonight's series of voices uh, with Kirshner Ryle. Series of Voices is an author-centered series of readings and conversations on books from or about Central and Eastern Europe, Russia, Central Asia, and the Caucasus. Our long-term partner for this series is the Seminary Co-op Bookstores, the first not-for-profit bookstores whose mission is book selling. And although their stores remain closed to the public, they are fulfilling orders uh, and supporting book sales for virtual events like this one through their website, semcoop.com, when you place your order. You can choose from shipping, delivery to the local area codes, or curbside pickup. You can find more information about upcoming events in this series and other events at semcoop.com and the series website. Both are now in the chat function, chat box below. Uh, this evening is our first series of voices of 2021. Uh, we do have two upcoming events in this series that attendees might be interested in. On Tuesday, February 23rd, Peter Cease will discuss his recent children's book, Nikki and Viera, A Quiet Hero of the Holocaust and the Children He Rescued. And on Thursday, March 2nd, Olga Liefshin will discuss her book, A Life Replaced with Eleanor Gilbert. And you can find information uh, and links to register for those events in uh, also in the chat box. So uh, on to tonight's event. Uh, we are excited to welcome Dominique Krishna Riles. Uh, she received her PhD with distinction from Columbia University and is currently Associate Professor of Modern European History at the University of Miami. Her first book, Nationalists Who Feared the Nation, Adriatic Multinationalism in Habsburg, Dalmatia, Trieste, and Venice was published by Stanford University Press in 2012 and received the 2014 Book Prize from the Center for Austrian Studies as well as honorable mention from the 2012 Smith Award. Her new book and the, con and the topic of tonight's uh, event is The Fiume Crisis, Life in the Wake of the Habsburg Empire, which came out in December of 2020 with Harvard University's Belknap Press. She's an associate review editor for the American Historical Review, editor for the Purdue University book series, uh, Purdue University Press book series, Central European Studies, member of the editorial board for the Cambridge University Press Journal, Contemporary European History, and on the steering committee of the Modern European History Collective. And currently she is a visiting scholar at European University Institute uh, where she is working on her next book tentatively titled The Habsburg Mayor of New York, Fiorelli LaGuardia, which also means it is very early in the morning where she is. So we really thank her for uh, sticking agreeing to do a Chicago time event with us this evening. Uh, tonight, she will be joined in conversation uh, by Tara Zara, the Homer J. Livingston Professor of East European History and the College at the University of Chicago. Her research focuses on transnational history of modern Europe, migration, the family, nationalism, and humanitarianism. She's most recently the author of The Great Departure, Mass Migration and the Making of the Free World and with Leora Auslander, co-editor of Objects of War, The Material Culture and of Conflict and Displacement. Um, two last notes before I turn things over to Dominique and Tara. Uh, we will be giving uh, away up to 10 copies of The Fiume Crisis. And so if you're interested in being eligible, we just ask uh, for you to let us know, put your name in the chat box uh, at, and uh, that will take care of that. Uh, as well as we do ha will have time for questions and answers at the end. The Q&A box uh, is below, is also open. Uh, you can put your questions in there at any point, uh, as well as uh, like slash upvote any questions that you are particularly interested in as well. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Dominique and Tara for the rest of the evening. Okay, hi everyone. Um, it's wonderful to see so many students, friends and colleagues um, in the audience. I wish I could actually see you, but um, thank you all for, for joining us here. Um, it's particularly exciting to get to have this conversation with Dominique Ryle today. This is one of the most, uh, I think, exciting books to come out in um, 
recent times in the field of Habsburg uh, and Central European history. And I think part of what Dominique is going to explain to you in a minute is precisely how this book fits into that history rather than um, the Italian historiography it's traditionally placed in. Um, Dominique, uh, we're, we are assuming that most of you have not read the book, although I know some of you have read at least parts of it. Um, so she's going to give a 10-minute uh, presentation um, that kind of outlines some of the main points and arguments. And then I'll open up the conversation with a few questions just to get things started. Um, but then I hope that we can spend a substantial amount of time um, answering all of your questions because with this audience, I am sure we're going to have some some great some great questions for further conversation. Um, so, before she falls asleep, since it's one in the morning, I'm going to turn things over to Dominique Ryle. Thank you, Dominique. Hi. Um, if anyone doesn't know it, I have the biggest intellectual crush on Parizar. So uh, being here is totally worth it. Also, every the entire team at the University of Chicago and Seminary Co-op Bookstore has, uh, they, they were the first people to contact me about the book. So um, I feel a lot of emotional charge about being here. So I'm going to, I don't know if I'm going to make 10 minutes and hopefully no one's going to turn me off. Um, I'm going to try and put this story in the story I thought it was about. So it's called The Fiume Crisis, Life in the Wake of the Habsburg Empire, but it's actually the subtitle more than the title. So I'm trying to make an intervention about thinking, like what Tara just said, thinking about the Habsburg Empire in the post-Habsburg times in all of, all of the challenges of what it meant to live in this thing in which you were in a state that had many sub-states and all sorts of differences and uh, hundreds, not hundreds, but dozens of languages and hundreds of different economic and social situations that were all constantly getting tied to being part of a state. And then the state dissolved. One of the strangest things about the Habsburg Empire is never the fall, it's always the dissolution. So it, it, all of a sudden it just dissolves, but everyone's left standing. So this book is about what does it mean to be left standing? What, what is your world? How do you get up in the morning and your money is made by a place that doesn't exist anymore? What if the dollar, what if America, the United States of America disappears? What is your dollar? Uh, what, what is your law? What is your citizenship if your state disappears? So that's what the goal of the book is. But I used the Fiume crisis as this kind of vehicle to really get to why haven't we been telling this story and what were, what were the goals of telling it differently and why shouldn't we? I don't know if I'm gonna be clear, but let me just take you through the paces. Most human beings have never heard of Fiume. Uh, and that's fine. It, well, I mean, you're, in some ways you're lucky uh, <laughs> because usually if you've heard of Fiume, it's not about the town itself. Today, the town is called Rieka. Rieka means river. Fiume means river. This is the river that the entire town is about. You might notice this is no Mississippi. This is no Danube. This is not some big river that's so important. This is a a non-navigable, very insignificant river whose official name is Little River. So, uh, so if you think about why is this town called River, it's because this river has served for centuries as an administrative border between different powers, whether church power, so this is where bishoprics and you know, everything to the West is in one bishopry and the everything to the right uh, the, is in another. And then in the 19th century, it became a border between the Hungarian kingdom city state of Fiume, that's what it, this part, and the Croatian kingdom's town of Sushak. So this is like, if you were thinking in American terms, it's like New York City, this is Manhattan, and this is Brooklyn, and or Buda and Pesh. So it was a, a completely interdependent place in the 19th century and after World War I, which is 
the subject of my book from 1918 to 1921, but it had administrative and legal and political separations that were very important. This thing was the ninth largest industrial port in continental Europe before World War I. That thing is all a money-making boom town before the end of the Habsburg Empire. And it was just growing. Every year was growing. It just money, yummy, yummy money. And part of the reason it grew was because it was kind of like a Hong Kong. It was outside of normal state enterprises. And because of that, it had special laws, special privileges. After World War I, it became a point of contention. And I just want to explain why I call it the Fiume crisis instead of the Lieka crisis, because it's very important to realize that this history is usually told about, is this an Italian city, a Fiume, or is this a Croatian city, Lieka? I'm not, uh, that's, that history is very related to the history I tell, but what I'm really telling is, Who's gonna get this jewel? Why do they want it? And what do the people in the town want of their jewel? Okay, so I call it the Fiume crisis, not for any national reasons of saying it's an Italian city, but more because of the political power they have of being a separate space. If it was Rieka, it would include Sushak. Fiume is just this. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to lay out some ground here that anyone who knows this part of the world already knows, but I'm assuming most humans don't. I had to learn it too. So I'm just kind of moving that way. You don't think of the word fume crisis because of this. You usually think of it because of this, the Paris peace treaties. So if you pick up any book about the Paris peace treaties, if you read a biography of Woodrow Wilson, if you read a biography of Lloyd George or his two volume memoirs, if you read anything about Italy, you will hear the word fiume far too often for a town that only had 50,000 people. And the reason why you hear is because who's gonna get the jewel becomes a reason for the only walkout from one of the winning powers from the Paris Peace Conference just weeks before the German Versailles Treaty is supposed to be signed. This little town almost threatened the peace about what to do with Germany after World War I. And so if you look at the big history of the peace conference, something that seems very insignificant becomes part of this major history. And, and it's about Italy, which, you know, when we think about World War II, Italy is not on the winning side, right? Mussolini, fascism. After World War I, they are on the winning side. They're one of the big four. And they walk out because Wilson basically says, you're never going to get Fiume. So in the historiography or the history of post-World War I, Fiume is incredibly important because it seems like how national matters and local matters actually do affect what happens in Paris. The other reason that even more people know what the Fiume crisis means is because of this bald guy, Gabriele D'Annunzio, who if we were a hundred years ago, you would know who he was. If you're someone who goes to a book talk at six o'clock in the evening, you would know who Gabriele D'Annunzio was. He was the most famous living Italian in 1919. He was not famous because of being some Italian politico. He was famous for writing novels about sex. He was famous for doing unconscionable things and telling it with very exciting language. He was a decadent poet. He, he wrote plays where the main actress was his lover and then he wrote about it. And during World War I, he became the G.I. Joe of World War I in Italy. 
He was in his 50s. He volunteered. He was the oldest volunteer officer. I think he was a lieutenant. I can't remember right now. But he became the embodiment of Italian pride of being in the war. And if you were in the war in World War I and you were Italian, it was hard to feel pride. It was a very, very unsuccessful, deeply painful war effort. Uh, people, the, the amount of social and political anger around the war in Italy was enormous. But D'Annunzio, this guy, was, spoke above it. He was a PR campaign for the war. And after the war, while all those people in Paris were arguing about this town, Fiume, he was the loudest of saying, we fought and died, we deserve our goodies. We deserve a town that wants to be part of Italy. So when the diplomatic stuff was going on, what the Fiume crisis is usually known as, this guy became the kind of spokesman of a big movement of Italians who before had never even heard of Fiume, who then decided Fiume became the symbol of recognizing it, it, Italian uh, victory. He coined this term, if you've ever read a textbook of European history in World War I, you will have heard this term called the mutilated victory. He created that term of we gave it, we gave everything for victory. And then the peace conference, Woodrow Wilson, the diplomats, the stuff shirts, mutilated our offering. And he convinced about two or 300 ex-veterans, veterans, current soldiers, misfits, to follow him in a walk to Fiume, a march to Fiume. He didn't walk. He was in a red convertible Fiat. You can't make this up. But he, he became this figurehead of going, all right, Woodrow Wilson. All right, Paris. What are you going to do? Let's see it. Bring it. He walked into the town, Fiume by this point was occupied by inter-allied troops, kind of like Vienna or Berlin during after World War II. And he basically said, what are you gonna do? And the inter-allied troops left without a single shot being fired on September 12th, 1919. This guy in his convertible, this old, old for back then old, I mean, I'm, I'm almost his age, but this old guy, led these other guys and took over a town and basically said to the Paris Peace Conference, an international power, bring it. This story is a fun one to tell. I mean, I, I, I see that there are a lot of professors in the, in the house. So you, many of you will use this story because undergraduates really like this story. I mean, it's so weird. But it's a great story because it's not just a story. It's used to situate how World War I leaps to fascism. And the reason, and it's called proto-fascism, and D'Annunzio is called proto-Mussolini. Mussolini does his March of Rome in 1922, so only you know, three years after Fiume. So why does Fiume mean proto-fascism? Part of it is you know, the bald guy on the balcony revving up nationalism and everyone getting excited. But most of it is actually about the people getting excited, is about the people cheering from the balcony. They're called the legionnaires for, for D'Annunzio. They're a very motley crew. There's not, it's not like fascism. It's not a political party. It's made up of all sorts of people who have different ideas, or maybe they don't even have any clear political ideas. But these are guys who think it's worth risking it all to follow the man, to follow the mission, to follow the dream to follow the nation, to follow Italy. And they, uh, many of them are, are incredibly excited about how paramilitary all of this is, that it's a continuation of the war. It's, it's the war moving on to finally get the victory they deserve, to unmutilate the victory in, in D'Annunzio's terms. The other part of the story that really makes this crazy story mean something is, what it represents about nationalism and the state, right? So what is happening here? Italy has its delegates in Paris trying to battle it out with Wilson. 
And on the ground, you have these nationalists who go, I don't trust my state or my delegates. I'm gonna do it on my own. We're gonna, we're gonna make Italy, not the state, not the liberal state, not these parliamentarians who are always compromising. They're always corrupt. We are the state. The story ends at Christmas time, 1920, in the weirdest way. The Italian state bombs the town to get D'Annunzio out. The Italian nation state ends the story of Italian paramilitary populace. I, I, I hope you guys have noticed that I'm saying Italy, Italy, Italy all the time, because this is what the Fiume means in, 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 if you've ever heard of it. It means the womanizing bald guys that convince hundreds, then thousands, then hundreds of thousands, then millions of people to challenge liberalism, to challenge what nation and state and its relationship is. The beginning of fascism outside the state politics around the nation and empire and expansion. This never happens. The Yugoslav historiography and the ex-Yugoslav, so creation or what have you, agrees with the story. They never agree. Italian historiography and Yugoslav and creation, they never agree about the Adriatic. They do agree about D'Annunzio, that somehow he is the precursor of erasing the presence of Slavic speakers on the Adriatic. And in fact, when he went into that town, on his in his convertible, he with women kissing him and and flowers being thrown at him and everybody happy he's coming to liberate the city. The people who aren't being mentioned at all are the ones who might be a little afraid of being liberated by Danunzio because this town was a Habsburg town galore. It was filled over 50% of the town did not identify itself as mother tongue Italian and over 30% of that town identified itself either as Croatian or Slovene speaking. And so how the ex-Yugoslavs tell the story is Danunzio is the first clear vision of ethnic cleansing, of erasing a Slavic presence on the Adriatic and in this town. Danunzio is the one who tried to erase Rijeka and make Fiume. So this is part of an enormously long history. I mean, long, I mean, we're, if you're talking to a medieval historian, this is very short, but in, in modern history, very long history of fascism. And if you ever open a book, any book, I dare you, look in the index, you'll find Danunzio and you'll find Fiume. There's no way around it because it's part of this, how do you get from 1918 to 1922? Strangely enough, the story is getting picked up now by global historians. Uh, you can't be global and just talk Paris. You have to add some other places and call it global. Fiume is one of the places that gets added. Uh, the most famous cases so far are The Vanquished uh, by Robert Gevat. He has an entire chapter on this showing how the, the paramilitary presence in Europe can't get squashed because there is no state willing to deal with them. And Pankaj Mishra, his entire introduction of the long history of populism, the long history of how did we get to Boris Johnson and Donald Trump and ISIS begins with Fiume saying, this is where it's really the combination of media, the man and anger changes politics. It's a weird story to use as explaining fascism. Uh, there, Danunzio never identified himself as a fascist. Many of his followers did later, some of them during, but most of them later. What the story is actually known as is as a party, as a Woodstock. It's the most famous book about the 15 months that Danunzio and his uh, followers are in the town is called The Revolution Party. And, and it's filled with stories of uh, gender fluid uh, nudists who all sleep in trees and are aviators and are pirates and the futurists come and there's a lot of swimming and a lot of having sex with a lot of people you shouldn't cocaine it's a big Woodstock party of being outside the world while you're at the center of the world. I hope no one thinks that's what fascism is uh, <laughs> fascism is violent fascism is angry. Fascism hurts. 
the, the Fiume story about that 15 months is not about pain. Even the end of it, even the beginnings and the ends are not about pain. They're very unviolent. The guy comes in in a convertible and no one shoots at him and everyone kisses him and throws him flowers. He gets out of the town. He names it the Christmas of blood. He, the town is attacked by the Italian state. Less than 50 people died. Remember, we just got out of World War I. Many more than 50 people had just died. A lot of these people are veterans. A lot of them had seen their, their friends, their family, everyone die. This is no bloody Christmas, but it's termed that way. It's, it's set up, there's, it, there's a scenography around all of this. And this to me is scary, that this is the origin story of violence, of fascism, and there's so little violence. So why is there so little violence? There, there's all the ingredients, right? Nationalism, paramilitary, veterans, World War I, uh, chaos outside the state. This should be like the Freikorps in the Baltics. This should be like Macedonia. This should be like Ukraine. And the answer that most historians, very, very smart historians give is this thing. Is, uh, I can't, here's my arrow. This is Danunzio. Is charisma is the ideas, the, 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 the perfect phrase, the martyr city, the mutilated victory, the, the celebrity, the everyone wanting to have a leader that doesn't seem like just yet another corrupt politician. And so why no violence is usually described as having a movement people believe in. And that's why all of this change isn't about hurt. But the problem here is that most people think the whole story is about Danuncio and those two or 300 followers. And many, many more people come to the town to follow him too. At some point, I think they have, they never trust numbers at this time period or ever. But here, maybe there's a thousand or two in Christmas uh, 1919, then they go back down. So let's say, a me, uh, let's not get into numbers. There are over 50,000 people who live in this town. And most of them, don't identify as mother tongue Italian speakers. And most of them were just in a war, World War I, in which they were on the Habsburg side. The Habsburg side was fighting the Italian side. That famous guy, D'Annunzio, the, 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 the porta voce, the, the speaker of Italian nationalism was calling Austrian scum and Croatians monkeys and we should all kill them. We deserve to expand. We deserve everything because of our victory. He's talking against the people in this town who just lost their brothers and fathers and they even got bombed once uh, by the Italian forces. So try to understand how charisma, where he's quoting Dante, uh, is working with a town that mostly doesn't identify itself as mother tongue Italian and had just gone through the war against his side, uh, is a little tough to understand. So that's basically what I did is try to think, well, what is this story? Why is there so little violence? And if you think it's because the Nuncio came with his followers, I want you to look at what his followers thought they were doing. This is a Vanity Fair cover of Thugs. These are really proud guys of being there and being ruthless. And they were there about expanding Italy. So, so little violence is not because of this uh, peacekeeping force of Danunzio, nor does the charisma story seem to make a lot of sense. So, and I'm gonna end now and so that we can have fun because I you know, woke up and did my disco nap because I get to talk to Tara Zara and hear all the questions. So I'm gonna end very soon. But what I went into the archives for was to re-people the town of Fiume with not just D'Annunzio and his followers, to find out why was there so little violence? Why in a town of 50,000 is there complicity? And what I found, and I always show this slide, is this is how I thought of it. I think I wrote this in 2012, and this is what fancy Harvard made out of it, is I found a ghost state. I found all these structures that were being used manipulated, changed, compromised, saved, protected in order to avoid revolution, in order to avoid bloodshed, 
in order to keep on going, in order to create some kind of consensus, or at least not push people too much in order to take a side. And so very quickly, there's a, a, a intro and a first chapter that is basically like, you think you know Fiume, or maybe you don't, let's be honest, no one does. Uh, these are all the stories we tell about and why they're weird. So basically what I just did in 10 minutes. And then there's a very short conclusion. And in between that is the real book, chapter two through five, which is looking at what do people do who wanna keep a state going when the state is gone? So just again, as Americans, think about if the United States disappeared and you're in Illinois, how do you make Illinois now the only state? And so you have a lot of questions. What is money? How do you do money when the maker of the money is gone? What is law? We have state law, but we also have federal law. So how do we how do we do this? What are what are the choices? What are the problems? How do you keep people going? What is citizenship if your state is gone? How do we decide this? Now we get to decide who citizens are. Citizens have rights. Citizens get welfare. Citizens get help. Are we helping everybody? Are we not? Who are we? And then finally, what? Where do we sit in the world if our, our between us and the world is gone, between our, our federal state or our empire? The overall argument of the book is that this is a time of unbelievably strong and loud political nationalism. No way around it. Everybody knows what the nation is. Everybody is being pushed to tell their story in national ways. But under it, there's other stuff going on too that are consolidating the goodies or consolidating the day-to-day -day or consolidating a world that is livable or at least complicitable. I don't know if that's a word, probably not. I don't love Rieka Fiume. I mean, now I've been there enough that I care about it deeply. I didn't start this book for that. So go, ending where I, I began, this is about what it means when something dissolves in front of your eyes and how it's it's always told now as bloodlands and the shattered zone of empires and that's also true but it's the other part of the, the opposite is also true is that worlds continued people made all these tough choices they had kids they had futures they had hopes they had loves how did they do it how did they keep on going Okay, now I get to hear it, Tarzan, and I can get a break and have some water. You're on mute. I'm on mute. Thank you so much, Dominique. Um, that was just wonderful and engaging and um, a really fantastic, um, I think also presentation of um, the first chapter of the book in particular, where you tell all, you, you give an overview of, of all the stories that have been told uh, about Fiume. Um, I want to dive right into the second part of the book um, where you tell us your story of Fiume, um, a very different one, and one that you argue is very much about um, aspirations for continuity. <laughs> Uh, with a Habsburg past, one in which Fiume had had a special status um, and in which the people of Fiume, um, I guess, I mean, you would argue felt that they were relatively well off or, or okay. Um, so, I mean, to put, to put it um, really in Dominique's terms, she argues that the people of Fiume wanted to um, be a part of Italy, not because they were Italian nationalists, but because they saw their best hope of, um, of continuity, of being a part of an empire like the Habsburg Empire. They believed that, that their chances were, were better in, um, in Italy than in Yugoslavia. So I would love for you to talk more about, about that calculation. And, and I mean, of course, people couldn't know what was going in, into the future, but how they, how and why they imagined that the future would be uh, brighter in Italy from an imperial perspective. But even more importantly, um, I think this book has huge implications for how historians think about uh, the end of the First World War. Um, 
your book has come out along with a whole explosion of publications um, in the in in the wake of the anniversary of the war and its aftermath. But I don't think any go quite as far as you in questioning the meaning of 1918. Um, as you just said, it's not that you're arguing nationalism is important or that it isn't a force, but you are arguing very much against, um, you know, what had almost become a consensus that 1918, at least as far as Central Europe was concerned, marked the end of empire, that um, everybody, you know, to, to use um, Erez Manella's words, you know, that the Wilsonian moment was about the rejection of empire, or at least that that's how anti-colonial nationalists interpreted it, um, even if the um, great powers had other ideas. Um, you say, no, actually what the people of Fiume wanted was more empire. <laughs> um, so I feel that really um, maybe forces us to rethink the meaning of 1918 altogether. Um, and maybe uh, I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts about the extent to which you see this argument as an intervention in a more global history of 1918. Does it have implications beyond East Central Europe? Um, and should we be thinking beyond the binary categories of nation state and empire altogether? That was probably three or four different questions rolled <laughs> into one, um, but I wanted to talk for a little while so that you would catch your breath. Well, uh, I have the habit of doing that in my questions too. So I, I, I now understand why people hate me. No, but I don't. Um, you just set me up to do my book better. And so let me try and do it a little better. We have this vision of Italy as, um, as the kind of second tier European country that's always a mess and always, you know, we just are having another change of government, you know, and mafia and corruption. But we forget what post-World War I felt like and looked like in, 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 the, in Eastern Europe. And what the options were, were scary options. Uh, some people look at the, looked at them as amazing opportunities to create what they wanted to before. So the normal historiography is about uh, the people who made the nation states that were trying to make it before, maybe not in the same situation, no one could imagine what happened, but, but it was this land grab or policy grab or state grab um, of, uh, of activists and elites and, you know, both Tara and I are wearing red, socialists, let's not forget there's a Bolshevik revolution going on here, of, of, of deep distrust of a world that had been and great hope of the world that could be. And, and that is true in many, many cases. But activists, the ones that give up their lives for changing the world are not the majority. They are the inspirational, maybe for bad things, uh, minority. And uh, my book is trying to create the context of why do you go along? What, what, what is complicity? In, in these big movements of change. Going back to Italy, the, the kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes, which then becomes Yugoslavia, and I always insist on not calling it Yugoslavia because Yugoslavia becomes pretty, pretty centralized state in the interwar. It is not at the beginning. No one really knows what it's gonna be. It's, it's, it already is a state. I mean, they, they signed this thing in Corfu, but no one knows yet how that state's going to work. And it was a theater of one of the most devastating parts of World War I with some of the worst mortality rates and the most destruction. And it was never a state. It's railway lines, how it worked, most of it was the creators of primary resources for the, the, the states that ran it to go sell it off to the world. So if you think of a town like Fiume, which is a hub of global commerce, uh, you want to be part of a state that's organizing global commerce. The Kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes definitely have that ambition. It's not like they're asleep at the wheel, but they, have to, they still have to build the car. Italy is already a car of empire. It's already organizing consistently to try and be a global presence, not just politically, 
but also economically. So these guys, and I'm saying this intentionally, guys in Fiume, because there are very few women leaders in Fiume, even though they get suffrage um, in 1919 before Denuncio gets there, they, they are organizing around how do we keep booming? How do we stay the same? A lot of them were Italian nationalists who were in charge after 1918. But they were, they were working within the empire, pushing for more autonomy before. They weren't pushing for separation. They were pushing for difference. They were pushing for special privileges. And so what I see is happening is a continuation of decades of imperial work of pushing for special privileges. And in, in going to your Manella point, they are reading the news. They are watching all the haggling about what's going to happen to Africa and what's going to happen in Asia and what's going to happen in the Middle East. And they're thinking in terms of this is an imperial haggle. I think Manella's book had uh, the, 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 the success it did because A, he gave agency to worlds that wanted out of empire. But that's when you read the news and you're looking for a way out. If you really, if you're lo not looking for a way out and you're looking for a better in, like what my guys are doing, the news is not the end of empire. The news is consolidation. Let's get uh, going. Ooh, you know, at the end of the poker game, who gets all the chips? Putting it in all the new empires, and and we do know that that's what happened. And it's not some backroom deal. It was open and there. So Manella's book about the Wilsonian moment is about people reading what they want to see and trying to utilize it to make a Wilsonian world that maybe even Wilson wasn't really that convinced of. But the people that I see think, ooh, how are we gonna be on the right side of that card table on getting the right chips? Um, I, I'm so glad, Tara, and then finally, because I, I want more questions and I, I'm so sick of my own voice. Um, I, my, my book is chapter two through five. My book is not what I just did. My book is really thinking about, okay, you got a flag. Where did you get this flag? You know, we just went through four years of war. Where did the material to make that flag come from? Why are you, why are you raising it? Did someone make you? Do you want to? What does it cost you? Why are you doing this? So what is this money in your hand? What is the law? Are you manipulating the law? Are you sick of not knowing what the law is? So what I really tried to do, and I hope this is why I wrote the book, I want the history of Poland to be like this. I want three empires in one. Poland is made up of three different empires with lawyers from three different backgrounds and people who lived a day to day with three different currencies. How are they doing this in 1919 after being one of the most devastating theaters of the war? And also my, to my heart, Yugoslavia. I mean, that's even more, more complicated. How do you do this? So I hope, and I hope, you know, my vanity, I hope my book is an intervention about thinking about post-1918 so that we think about why do people let the activists be the voice? And what is the, the problems of living in, in how do I do this? And, and what is my state promising to, to resolve this? So um, that was fantastic. Um, I, I, we have a, a bunch of questions already, so I'll just limit myself to um, two more that I'll combine into one. <laughs> the first is I, I would just love if you could, I mean, we have a bunch of students in the audience who have just been studying the Habsburg Empire. They know what the Habsburg Empire is. I would love you to tell us a bit more about um, the ways that the ghosts of the Habsburg Empire in Fiume after World War I. So when you look at currency and citizenship and other forms of law, like where are those co continuities? Um, and relatedly, one thing I've just always wondered um, is, did the people of Fiume just bet wrong? Like what actually happened to them in the, you know, once they were part of Italy, did they, did they retain any of those special privileges? Did they, uh, 
you know, did they retain any kind of economic prom prominence in the global economy, given that Italy has so many ports? Um, so that's one question. The second, I guess, is more uh, a bigger question, which is um, you've really framed the book as one that's not about fascism. <laughs> I mean, you you say, yeah, OK, Denunzio, it's about fascism to some extent, but not in, you know, you, you want to tell a different story that focuses on the people of Fiume and not on Denuncio, the, uh, the poet brigand. But perhaps it's also a different story about the origins of fascism, one that's rooted more uh, in the aspiration for empire um, and a certain kind of global prominence um, as it is rooted in extreme nationalism and a certain aesthetic um, and kind of populist um, politics. So I don't know if you think there's anything to that, but I'd be interested in, um, you know, maybe it's also the moment we're getting into the into the 2020s to to rewrite the history of early fascism, um, and you might have a perspective on that as well. Um, did they bet wrong? Well, it's hard to say because what they were betting is that they would determine how they annex themselves to Italy. So I had originally thought I was going to write this history from 1918 to 1924. In 1924, Mussolini annexed Fiume to Italy. But he did not, there was a coup in 1922, a fascist coup, and then this, the city-state was basically, it was an independent League of Nations city-state from 1921 to 1924. But just like as we saw in the mandates, or we saw in Poland or all of East Central Europe, the League of Nations didn't do their job of overseeing how to create a world that followed laws. And so uh, what happens in Fiume is, is, is a different echo of what's happening everywhere in this League of Nations world. And when it gets annexed, it's not getting annexed in any way based on what they want. So in they are empired. They're not, they're not, self-annexing. Uh, the the his, history of Italian new territories is not one of, of an, e, an easy tra transition. And there's a lot of new fascinating work about, about looking about this, this ever expanding, uh, uh, Roberta Puga, uh, ever expanding nation state that's trying to figure out, are we one state or are we a state with an empire? And Fiume is in between, but they definitely lose everything they were trying to get. So they bet wrong, but they weren't betting on getting annexed the way they got. They were betting to become a San Marino. They were betting to be a micro state within an empire. They were not betting on being, why aren't we as cool as Bologna? Um, in terms of the uh, empire and global history, I, I work on lot, small places no one cares about. That's what I do. My first book was a regional history. It wasn't a small place. It was actually a huge place if you think about it, but it was about a place that people don't think is what makes history. And this is yet another thing that is um, kind of a pawn in the chess game of making history, right? So when you look, I, as I said, you're always gonna find Fiume in this historiography of fascism, and international law and the peace treaty. So it's part of global history, but it's just a, it's just a fake, right? There's no, there's no local in that story. It's, it's just a chess piece in, in a game in which they're not the players. Um, what my book shows is they wanted to be a chess piece in that game. They, they didn't, they were a chess piece in the last game. They were willing participants. It's a boom town. 60% of the town moved there in the 20 years before World War I. They didn't move there because everyone missed the sea. Uh, these are people coming from Ukraine moving there. They're coming there for jobs. They're coming there for global commerce. This is a town that represents the, the promise of global. So, and you know, I love your next book. <laughs> this is why I'm constantly obsessed with talking to you about it is, is who feels cheated by the global and who feels like they're dependent on the global. So it, it is an intervention in global history in terms of thinking about the globe as one of dependency 
sometimes in your book, uh, you know I want it out tomorrow, um, <laughs> COVID, thanks a lot, but uh, uh, about the anger around dependency. Well, this is a town that is very excited about dependency, as long as they get to be handmaidens. And finally, uh, and I'll end here about fascism. Um, yes, it is. It is. Uh, a, a, this is a place that becomes a fascist town, but it's a, it's not a happy fascist town because they become a third tier town. They become a political symbol of fascist empire and national liberation, but in the day to day. Trieste, Venice, Ancona, and Bari are the ports uh, of the future. And so uh, it, it's a, I think that Trieste is a much more useful city to look at how fascism works with local politics and how interdependent they are then looking at Fiume, Fiume really is empired. Hmm. They're, they're less, I mean, there's a lot of fascists in Fiume. I'm not saying it's not a fascist city, but they're, they're, they're and this is my final point. I think that uh, we can't understand uh, the move to authoritarianism in East Central Europe without looking at all of the tries, all of the years and years of, of struggle, of living in a post state. And so instead of looking at Fiume as the history of Italian fascism, which is not the history of a post state, I really would like it to be more part of an Eastern, East Central European story of look at how many times they tried to be part of a liberal imperial global order. And it's just too hard. They really tried. Uh, and one ages. I don't tell anyone, but, uh, and the aging makes authoritarianism go, okay, whatever, Just, can you fix this? <laughs> um, so anyways, I think that that's the story of East Central European fascism. That's exactly what I was, what I was thinking. Um, and I think that's, you really succeed in telling that story. We're almost out of time. I feel really no, careful. Oh my God. I, know, oh, I did too, but uh, let's at least take one question. There's a, a really interesting one here from, they're all good, great questions, but um, this is one I think you might um, have some particular insight on. Uh, Oral Bellinson asks, uh, and I, I'm sorry for having to <laughs> um, vo be the voice of these questions. If we think of subjective feelings of stability, did anyone expect or think that Denunzio's weirdos would actually become some kind of permanent regime. You mention in your book how he and his followers were legally marked as others, but how did ordinary Croatians make sense of periodizing this transition? If they assume that it will all end once they join Italy, was Denunzio a somewhat debilitative experience in the search of some sense of anchoring in time in trying to figure out what the future might hold? Did anyone think Denunzio's festival is going to be routinized and long lasting? Um, that's, I love that question. So uh, there was a, there was just a special issue that came out in Italy on the hundredth, uh, you know, Fiume, whatever, it's the centenary. And uh, Vanni D'Alessio, who's a historian, uh, he's, his job is in Naples, he lives in Rijeka, his family is partially from Rijeka, um, wrote about creations looking at Denuncio. So trying to understand why, so he's looking at all these uh, leaders, local leaders in Fiume and Sushak who are kind of obsessed with them. So <laughs> they just, they just can't look away. It's like, and, and it's not just a freeway accident that you can't look away from. It's also like, is this the new politics or not? They're, they're, they're really wrapping their minds around it. Um, and he doesn't have an answer because things just keep on happening, right? So the, the problem with answering Oral's question, which is, I love it, is that we, just things keep on changing. So there's no Danuncio in September 1919, then he keeps on changing, right? He makes this new constitution and he, first he's a monarchist, then he's a Republican, then he's a syndicalist, then he's a regent, then, I mean, it, it's insanity. So uh, I think the answer is, um, what do they think is gonna happen next? I think that you almost get into a, 
what we've been living with Trump is you just can't know what's going to happen next. Is this our future or is this a process story? So it's hard to answer that question, but, but it is important to think about people, how hard it is to be in the insecurity of a moment where you can't see it as stable. And, and it's actually pretty proud of not being stable, right? He, Danuncio and his, and his cohort are all about not being parliamentarians, are all about not being politicians. They don't wanna be politicians. They wanna be the shock troops of change. So, so it's, hard, it's hard to understand. Leo Valiani, who's probably the most famous historian of the Habsburg empire in the Italian speaking world, he wrote, this book called the dissolution of he's from Fiume, and he gave a um he gave an interview about what was it like being a boy growing up during denuncio because i think he was 10 so he's jewish his family is hungarian uh 13 percent of the town identified as hungarian speakers he had been in budapest during the revolution and he said when denuncio made the new constitution no one understood it and no one took it seriously you never can trust a memoir but I can I can imagine that all of this is felt like a game. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Um, and there's a, a another one um, there. Again, there's many great questions, but um, an interesting one here from Rebecca Klein Um Thank you for your talk. Uh, my question, as you might guess, is about the Jewish population in Fiume. What kind of choices did they make? Uh, this was a port Jewish population in a special legal and political status region of the Kingdom of Hungary, not insignificant demographically. So where did they fit in this story? And did they face similar challenges as Jews in other former regions as, of Hungary as perceived proxies of the ethnic Hungarians in the Kingdom of Hungary? It's a great question and I'm gonna try and be brief just cause I know about time, but uh, I'm gonna say two things. Fiume in the history of the Holocaust of, uh, because it does get annexed by the kingdom of Italy has the highest death toll of any town in the kingdom of Italy because of its uh, Jewish population. The reason is because Fiume got annexed so late. So they made this law when the racial laws were made, Jews, who were not citizens before 1922 uh, were then considered non non, not under the same protections as, as, as Italian Jews. So strangely enough, uh, Jews in Fiume uh, were more likely to get sent to Auschwitz or Dachau or any of the concentration camps than anywhere else in the kingdom of Italy. So uh, it's important to put the Jewish question at the forefront of thinking about the larger consequences of the Fiume crisis. It is not Trieste. Trieste Jews were, sa were safer than Fiume Jews. 3% of the population is Jewish in 1919. Um, that doesn't seem like a lot, but it is a lot because they were very uh, active as, as Rebecca just said. And what's fascinating about Fiume is it's both Ashkenazi and Sephardic. So they have three synagogues in the town and one of them is uh, Sephar uh, one of them is Ashkenazi and two of them are Sephardic. So we have the only case in the kingdom of Italy where you have both, uh, both visions of uh, Judaism in Europe in the same town and it's a growing community. It's not a dying community. So the numbers of Jews are going up. During this time period from 1918 to 1921, there is about two weeks of vis visible anti-Semitism. And this is why I don't really use newspapers in my, in my book because the newspapers are written by three guys and one of them was anti-Semitic. But if you look at what happens to Jews between 1918 and 1921, I, I still haven't really seen any sign that they are being uh, spotlighted or victimized. What I have seen, because this is a boom town and a lot of the Jews who are moving, especially the Ashkenazi Jews who are moving to Fiume from Eastern Europe are playing up to the state. They're trying because they, you know, many of them learn Italian or Italian-esque uh, fast enough. They, they start being actually handmaidens of firing uh, Slavic speakers or whatever to show that they're on board with the Italian annexation story. So there, I don't see a lot of victimization of Jews, but I do see a lot of the newcomer Jews in Fiume being even in some ways 
cornered into complicity in order to not be in the unpopular category of Croatians in this time period. Wow, thank you so much. I'm really sorry we don't have time for more questions, but I hope that all of you will um, read Dominique's book, buy her book. Uh, some of you have, will have won her book, which is great. I didn't know there would be prizes here. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, and I'm just so grateful to you for getting up in the middle of the night to talk to us all. Um, and I all hope- right. You can invite me, I'm there. There's no way around. <laughs> thank you. We'll do this again, I hope, um, at a at a more uh, humane time for you. But in the meantime, congratulations um, on a great accomplishment. And thank you to everyone um, in the audience for coming. Thanks to Peters, who did all the work. Yes, thank you. Matthew. Esther and Matthew as well. <laughs> thank you very much to both of you. And thank you to everyone for coming. And I hope everyone has a great night. So, and hopefully we'll see everybody soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye.